Yeah, so Edgar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, again, thank you for, for the introduction, introduction and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Edgar Vandermeer and uh, I am, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, to start off with. Uh, as you can see on the slide right now, I'm a senior analyst digital analytics at Loyalty One, uh, otherwise known as the Air Miles Reward Program. Uh, and as part of my education, I have a Bachelor of Arts in European Studies from uh, Maastricht University. Uh, a little bit of a personal history for me. Uh, I was born and grew up in Bermuda. Uh, then from age 11, I lived in the Netherlands where I went to high school and I went to university at the University of Maastricht. Um, as you, as I mentioned, uh, I did European studies, uh, and I focused there on international and European law. Uh, it was a very broad course or, or education. Um, so I did courses in economics, statistics, history, law, uh, political science, cultural anthropology, and many more. Uh, and being such a broad field of study actually allowed me to focus on one of my passions, and that is aviation. Um, a little bit detached from what I do now, um, but uh, working with the, the Air Miles Reward Program uh, sort of shifts into the world of travel uh, and aviation as well and combines my skills in, in data uh, analytics. Um, as part of my degree, I wrote two theses on the topic of, of aviation and the aspects of international law pertaining to the in industry. So the first one was nationality and sovereignty in aviation. And the second one uh, was the road to the EU-US Open Skies Agreement. Um, so complete difference from uh, between my education and, and what I do now uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in 2010, I moved to Canada on a five-year, uh, sorry, on a five-month work permit with the summer camp. And after that, I had a one-year open work permit as part of the International Experience Class program. Um, I had zero idea of where my career would take me and fresh out of university, this is all I had lined up. Uh, the end of the summer came around in 2010 and um, through the summer job that I had at the camp, I met the person who would later be my boss. And he asked me the question, how would you like to work in the energy industry? And this kickstarted my career with ABS Energy Research, which later became NRG Expert. And in that job, um, at the start of my career, I relied very heavily on soft skills, uh, in addition to the skills I acquired on the job. So as you can, can imagine, my, my education, uh, my bachelor's degree was not, did not line up entirely with the field, um, but, I was able to use the skills and, like I said, the soft skills that I acquired in my studies, um, in addition to the skills acquired on the job to really grow in the role that I had been thrust into. Um, so I was, I found myself in a situation where I was in a client facing role in a growing organization. Um, and throughout the first year, year and a half of working there, uh, we also went through a rebrand and we had to reestablish the company um, and, and the name for the company um, while being very new to the industry myself. So being the small company that we were, I became the go-to person for data and analysis. Uh, my name was put on almost every product that we released and I quickly became the face of that company. Uh, even though a lot of work was putting into getting our name out there, customers would come to us for the data and, and for the analysis, and they saw us as the experts in the field. Um, so being fresh out of school, fresh uh, in the job, uh, it's a pretty daunting prospect. Um, suddenly, I was the one who was responsible for publishing reports and databases that would be used by the world's largest energy companies, uh, governments, uh, anyone doing anything in the energy sector. Um, and these reports would influence their decisions on multi-billion dollar investments. Uh, and they had my name on them. So quite scary. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, these companies relied on me to guide them with the data that I provided. So let's face it, uh, data can be boring. Nobody wants to sit for an hour listening to me while I flip through PowerPoint slides with numbers and tables. And yeah, I realize the irony of that statement while I'm here talking to you flipping through PowerPoint slides. But I don't know of anyone who's actually told me that they enjoyed reading a 500 page report, which I'd put together. Um, but thankfully they'd already purchased the report, so I got my paycheck. But we put so much effort into all of our work and all of our analysis, only to have the end users of that product or end users of, our, of all of the work that we've done, read it selectively and, and pick it apart for the parts that they are looking for or the conclusions that they're looking to reach. So yeah, being an analyst can be pretty thankless. Um, but at the same time, the job is very rewarding because the work you are doing and all the attention you're paying to the small details means that you are becoming an expert in your field. You can really become one with the subject matter and make it your own. Uh, to err is human and you will make mistakes. I, I know I have uh, <laughs> in my career, but uh, picking apart the data doing the research and going down those rabbit holes from time to time means that you are gaining insight and knowledge. And until you present that knowledge, it's knowledge about the business that only you and your team has. You are the, the person who knows the facts before anyone else because you are the one who's done the research and, and done the analysis on that. Um, and that can be a pretty, pretty powerful feeling. Um, but that's part of the job, and that's what we have to convey uh, to the other stakeholders in the business. So when you present the data, the people in the room may know about the topic. They may have uh, a high level, uh, some high level knowledge about the topic. They may also be very focused on that one topic, and they may, they may very well have details or know things uh, that, that you don't know, but you are the one with the data and the facts to draw conclusions and perform the analysis as a data analyst. Um, again, other people in the room may have other insights that you don't have because they may have had other meetings on the topic or they have a different view of the line of business than you do. So unless they're completely new to the topic, the people in the room will all have biases and preconceptions. So when it comes to the data that you present and the knowledge that you possess, you are the expert. You have put in the time and effort to really understand that data. You've done your deep dives. You've done your gut checks. You've done the all the steps that it takes to make sure that your data is reliable. You know where the data comes from, how it's collected, and you know where the data has taken you and the recommendations that you can make supported by your data. So. My job is to know my data. I know I have the skills to be able to collect, extract, and examine the data. That's what SQL, Java, Python, and my technical skills have given, given me. But my job is also to understand the data, but especially to help others understand that data. And that's why analysts are the experts. So coming back a bit to my job with NRG Expert, uh, I was also to build up. I was also able to build up a good relationship with journalists, and got asked for interviews for article, articles they were writing, and to give commentary on events that were happening around the world pertaining to energy. Um, I look back at some of those articles, and especially some of the radio and television segments, and I can see my development over the years. When I started out, I was thrust into the deep end and suddenly put in front of an audience of millions as an expert on the topic. I certainly didn't feel like one sometimes. Uh, the journalists were only the ones asking the questions. They had no idea of where they, or they had an idea of where they wanted their story to go, but I was brought in as the person who was supposed to know everything about the topic. Um, and I was nervous. That is a pretty daunting task to, to have to do, especially starting out in, in your career. 
but you have to have the confidence in your data. You are the expert. Um, but coming back to my my nervousness, uh, uh, you can see in the photo here, I was so nervous that I even forgot my suit jacket for my on first on screen interview. My education helped me settle my nerves in a way because it taught me how to give diplomatic answers. Um, I'm not saying this is the best way to go for every presentation. I mean, we all know how much we love politicians uh, and their diplomatic answers. But when it came to speaking to journalists, it helped. Uh, it helped because I knew that my audience could have been anyone, anywhere, who picked up that newspaper and read the article, or a person who turned on their TV and heard what I had to say. So diplomatic answers, broad terms, helped because that was the audience I was speaking to. I didn't know exactly who was watching or reading. So I had to give short, succinct answers that made sense, but didn't dive too deep into the minutia. Answers that would get my point across and showcase me as the expert without being too detail oriented. Uh, the journalists trust me and the answers that I gave them. And that's why I was asked back for more interviews and insights. Being the expert means that people need to trust what you do. Fast forward back to the present and my job at Air Miles, and I speak to a completely different audience. I left Energy Expert in 2019, and I joined Loyalty One in 2020 as a senior analyst, digital analytics. In my new role, I'm not trying to sell reports or data sets. That was, in my old job, the main part. Uh, we did a lot of qualitative research, uh, a lot of qualitative analysis. These were then packaged into reports, um, which we sold off the shelf. We did some bespoke work. Uh, but joining Loyalty One, joining Air Miles really shifted my focus to me becoming an expert on our digital data. And Loyalty One is a company that thrives on data. Um, I don't know how familiar everybody is with Air Miles, but it's a free loyalty program, free rewards program. And it's often said that if something's free, then you are the product. And in this case, your data is our product. Um, and I'm currently the only analyst in the company who deals with the offers to uh, earn air miles with our partners on our mobile app and on, and on our website. So if you were to open up our mobile app um, or go onto our website and see the offers that earn you miles, it's my task to examine that digital data and recommend uh, to the business steps on how to improve that process, how we can leverage more out of that platform. Um, as a side note, our company is hiring at the moment. Uh, so please look on our website if you are interested. We also offer co-op placements for students, um, any level, any degree. We have a lot of open positions at the moment um, for analysts and anyone interested in, in data. Uh, but coming back to the differences between my roles. So no longer is my role customer facing. With Energy Expert, I was very out there in front of people, in front of our customers. Now, instead, I deal more with internal stakeholders and decision makers within our organization. So I can't give these people diplomatic answers all the time. They require hard facts and detailed insights. No longer am I speaking to as wide of an audience as possible. Um, what I do isn't being broadcast or published externally, but I still have to be prepared for my data to go to all levels of our organization. Um, I, I think our legal department may have something to say if I were to go on TV and speak on behalf of our company. That's not my role. Um, thankfully, journalists are not that interested in how many miles you can earn for toilet paper at Sobeys. When I present my data, I can be in a virtual room with any number of people. Um, most often, I would say there are about 10 to 15 people who I'm uh, speaking or who I'm speaking to and who are in those meetings. But even though they're all in that meeting, I'm not presenting to every one of those people. 
out of all of the people in the room, I'm only really presenting to one or two of them. Now, the other people are obviously still in the room and they're still hearing my presentation. But to know your audience is to know the people or who the people in the room are who have the power to make the decisions. And that's who you, your presentation should be the most valuable to. These are the people that you want to speak to and to tailor your presentation to. Uh, in my experience, these are often also the most senior people in the room, but that's not always the case. Uh, knowing the topic of the meeting, knowing what the people in the meeting want from you from the meeting is what should drive your content, what should drive the focus of, of your presentation, of your analysis. So. Once you've identified the people in the audience who are the key stakeholders and the one or two people who will take your information away and make business decisions based on that or guide the business decisions based on that, the next question to ask yourself is what do you want them to take away? Um, so on the next few slides, I've put together a few tips that I find help me when putting together a presentation on my data. So let's say you're presenting to a room of 10, 20, 30, or even 500 people. You cannot give everyone everything they may want. Identify those key decision makers and speak to what you feel you want them to take away. Ask yourself the question, what would you want the person I'm presenting to to tell the boss? So look up in the organization. Who does, who? reports to whom in the organization. What is the takeaway that you want that person who you're presenting to, to go up and say to the person above them, this is what, this is the meeting I was just in, this is what came out of it. The next tip or the next suggestion is be selective with the information you present. It's okay to stick to the key points and perhaps go into detail on one or two topics, but don't start talking at length about caveats in your methodology. Remember, you are the expert, and the audience has to know that they can trust you to be right. So you don't always have to explain yourself. Oftentimes, the key decision makers you are presenting to have so much else going on, they only remember the key takeaways. I find it's best to sometimes leave them with three points. They probably don't have the mental capacity to remember any more than that, if they can even remember three. So stick to the key points, go into detail if it's necessary, but remember to really articulate the main point or the main points that you're trying to get across. So the audience may also not remember what you want them to remember. Questions will come up and often presentations turn into discussions that can go in completely different directions. It's not always your job to steer the conversation back to what you see as the most important points. Sometimes that's not what your audience is looking to get from you. But because you know the data that you can that you've analyzed and that you've researched, you can speak to the questions that may arise and you can speak to them with confidence. So if someone throws a question at you that throws you completely through a curveball. Remember, you are the expert. You can talk to this point as well. You may not have the slides. You may not have the numbers right at your fingertips. It's also OK to tell someone, I don't have that ready for you. I can get back to you. But because you're the expert, you can still speak to it and you can answer the questions that arise from it. Uh, leading me on to my next point a little bit is have some information in your back pocket. So like I said in the last step, you will get questions. Try to anticipate these questions and where the discussion might go. That way you'll not only get thrown off in the middle of, that way you'll not get thrown off in the middle of your presentation. A recent example for me was discussing offers by one of our fuel and automotive partners. In my visualization, I grayed out everything but the particular partner's data. You could still see other partners' data, but it wasn't the focus of the slide. One of the people in the meeting interrupted me with a question and asked me about the grayed out data. Thankfully, I'd prepared a slide that precisely highlighted the very question he had asked. 
So I had that information in my back pocket, ready to go. I anticipated the question and it gave a, <laughs> when the question was asked, I actually got a smile on my face and I said, let me go to that slide. It really helps to think beyond the information that you're that you're presenting right then and there and come up with your own questions that you might ask based on what you're seeing or ask a coworker, ask someone who doesn't know the data as in depth as you do to review it with you and see what their questions are. So I hope I've been able to keep you interested in my presentation so far um, and I've been talking for a little bit now. To change things up, I'd like to do a little experiment with you. So I'm going to show you a few pictures. Um, I don't believe I can see the chat, so please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, but just shout out the first thing that you notice in each one of the pictures. So here we go. What are people seeing? Is that jellyfish? Jellyfish. <laughs> All right. We'll go to the next picture. What's the first thing you see? Lotus. Flower. All right. Yep. OK, next picture is a little bit trickier, but uh, let's see what people. It's the first thing you see. The Nikon camera. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm i not an expert in data visualization. Um, in fact, I'm always learning new things. And there are many great resources out there on data visualization. Um, one person that I've been learning a lot about is John Schwab Schwabish. His Twitter and YouTube are great places to start to get to know about his work. So one of the things that really stuck with me in a presentation he gave to our team recently and why I showed you those photos is a concept of pre-attentive processing. Um, our brains tend to automatically filter out what's important and draw attention to that. I try to keep that foremost in mind when I'm presenting. There are litany of ways to visualize data. Choosing the best visualization for each data set could be a presentation in and of itself. Again, there are many helpful resources to help you uh, along the way and give you inspiration. And there are also so many tools that can be used. Just think of Excel, Tableau, and Looker, just to name a few. So when you're telling a story or with your data, or when you're presenting, think about what you want your audience to walk away with. In the three photos I showed you, the first one, the only thing in the photo was the jellyfish. That really stood out. It was a white or beige background with a pop of color in the middle. The second photo, a lot of the background colors were dark and you had that pop of color from the flower. The third photo had a lot more going on in the photo. You sort of were looking everywhere. But the one thing that stood out was that yellow billboard, at least to me. So that, that pop of color, that one thing that stands out, think of that as your less is more. You want one thing to really stick out, really, distinguish itself from the rest of what's on the slide or what's in your presentation. So think about what you want your audience to walk away with. I've also already said it, but ask yourself, what, what would you want your audience to share with other people? Keep in mind that the people you're presenting to will not remember every small detail. You are the expert because you know the data and they can trust you. Give them those bullet points. You're the one telling the story, so guide your audience through the data instead of letting the data guide you. If you're presenting a graph, a chart, or a table, try not to use too many colors or text. Our eyes get drawn to the things that stand out. Again, that's why I showed you those pictures. The next time you make a chart, make everything gray. Then ask yourself, what am I showing? What am I speaking to in this chart? Or what do I want people to remember? You may find that there's only one line or pie segment or pathway that you are really using to illustrate your point. Give that segment a standout color and give it a caption. Draw the attention to that and forget about the rest. It's still there, it still helps illustrate, but it's gray, it's in the background. 
if someone wanted to go back and look at the slide, they can. If someone may come back and ask you for the data and you can have a conversation on it. But in your presentation, that's not the important part. The important part is that takeaway, is that one element that you want to try and convey to your audience. So give that the attention it, it deserves and really make that stand out. One thing that you may have noticed in this presentation is I've not used any real data visualizations or charts to get my point across. Um, and sometimes they aren't really necessary. Telling a story with your data can sometimes mean just that. Tell the story. Your visualizations will be far more effective if they illustrate what you're saying and they aren't the story themselves. Oops, sorry, I went too far here. Um, make your presentation relatable. So one final thing that I'll leave you with in the presentation is that notion of making things relatable. If I told you that in the last seven days in the city of Toronto, 17,293 people received a dose of a COVID vaccine, can you really get a sense for what that number means? So picture it, 17,293 people. It's, it's a number. I have nothing that I can relate that number to. I don't know what that is in terms of, is it good, is it bad, is it up or is it down? We can use charts for that. But if you're presenting just a single number, you can also use a different approach to visualizing or to really relate to that data. So if I told you that a Toronto subway train holds a maximum of 1,400 people, it would take 11 full trains to transport everyone who got a shot to get to that number, 17,293, 11 full trains. So you're standing on the platform and you have to let 11 trains go by before you reach that number, 17,293. So anyone who's ever ridden the subway pre-pandemic in rush hour probably has a very good sense of just how many people that is. And with that, um, I'm actually at the end of my presentation. Um, up on the screen, you'll see a QR code. Please feel free to add me to LinkedIn. Um, send a note that uh, that you got there from here, <laughs> so I so I know. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions and have any discussions that you may wish to have. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean. This is very, very informative. It is very, very informative. I know um, the information that you've provided will go a long way in um, helping most of our students um, in building their career as data analysts. And I like the Thank fact you. that you started from scratch, right? Someone with no um, data analytics background, but you were able to build yourself uh, yep. to become who you are. I mean, you accepted your challenges. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. So every 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 graduate from your program already has has a leg up on me uh, at the start of their careers because I had mm -hmm. zero data and analytics mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. uh, from from university. It's mostly on the job. On the job. So, uh, mm -hmm. so everyone graduating, uh, you're already ahead of me. You're right. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's so amazing. I like the fact that you know you were able to. I mean, uh, psych yourself. Um, you, I mean, you took a calculated risk, right? Because you entered into a field that is not your field, right? Because you did international business, but now you've ended up being an expert, data expert in energy and, and so on and so forth. So this is amazing. I mean, yeah, this serves as motivation for most of our students, especially those who are skeptical about the future. Um, their future of being data analyst. Yeah, good. Okay, so we will take some questions. Um, we will take some questions for Edgar, and then if you have any like I mean, questions, contributions, um, you can either raise up your hand or you can turn on your microphone. Um, you can type in the chat room, and then yeah, I'll give the platform. Okay, I think we have one, um, Zanbulio, Zanbu. 
Can you turn okay. on the microphone? Hi, Zambu. Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. So, so uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Can okay, so, ahead. so this is well, I've been hearing so far. It's absolutely like amazing story, and just what's fascinating for me is that you went from a art major in the Netherlands and came here to Toronto and doing something completely different. Yeah. And I remember you mentioned. Like the reason, one of the main reason you got the job in the energy company is that you have the soft skills. If you were relying mainly on the soft skills, because I'm kind of in the same situation. I'm trying to do something different from my major. And I'm just curious, what soft skills do you think is the most important, like in a team working scenario? Um, I'd say it's it's very role specific um i was hired into my first job um because i showed that i had research skills that i could focus on a topic and and come up with uh with something that really spoke to the details and the level of detail on that topic by having researched it um i was able to apply that even though it was again uh, arts or looking more at, at a sociology type of um, background and i was able to apply that to the energy industry in my first job um, looking at um, looking at at energy companies rating them but also because i'd had uh, an economics background i've i'd had some again this is probably getting into some of the hard skills but i was able to take the numbers and and apply the methodologies of what i had studied and what i had learned in school to the actual work so whereas school schooling had given me a level of expertise on european institutions the eu uh, i i that was the expertise it had given me, but it was the skills to get that expertise that I was able to to transfer over and apply. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think it was answered perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing answer from Edgar. And um, to add to what he just mentioned, um, I mean, he was able to identify business problems, right? Or uh, um, in conducting research, he was able to identify research problems. Um, he had the skills of conducting research methodology and stuff like that. So um, someone might see this to be more of academic, right? But he was able to apply this in real life, you understand? So, um, well, maybe, well, at a college, you might be doing other projects that might be more academic related, but the skills or the soft skills from what you've been doing from the program, you can apply those skills in real life and you can build yourself, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Are there any further questions? Are there any contributions? Are there any contributions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, to add to what I also mentioned, um, I think one thing that you also need to understand as data analyst is knowing your skills, know your capabilities, because we have some data analysts who are very good at coding. We have data analysts who are very good at identifying business problems. And we have those who are very good at presenting the results, or I mean, um, telling the story to convince decision makers to make informed decisions. So if, if you know where you stand, I think that also helps you a lot to be yourself. Yeah, uh, if I, I, I see there's a question, but I'll just add to that mm -hmm. as well. In, in my experience, um, I'm, I'm learning on the job every day. I, I taught myself SQL. Um, I'm I'm learning Python right now, and good companies will also give you that um, that opportunity to really develop your skills while you're on the job. You don't 
need to have everything right at the beginning. At least in my experience, that's that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But speak to your strengths. Know what your strengths are and speak to them. And when a company sees that potential in you, you can develop your other areas as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I believe there was a question I saw a raised hand. I think that was Adifemi. Adifemi, was your hand up? Actually, my ha my hand was not up, but I would love to actually comment on what he said. You know, okay. th there has been problem of uh, people that did not actually school here. Like you schooled in Netherlands, according to what you said when you were talking about your background. I schooled in Nigeria. So there has been this criticism from employers uh, uh, to recruit people that, that schooled abroad and actually had experience abroad. Like I had a very robust experience in, in finance, Malcolm, in audit compliance, coupled with business I mean, I mean analysis. But it's been very difficult. But I'm encouraged by you from, from your own experience that if you can do it, I can also do it with mm -hmm. the with the optimism that I'm also going through analytics program, which what you, you did you not have that experience. So I'm positive and I'm really encouraged by your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. And if I'll speak a little bit to my my own experience, um, I I left or I lost my job uh, with Energy Expert in 2019 and it took me six months to to find the job that I'm in now and I think one of the biggest barriers and, and bit, biggest bits of feedback that I had was that I was missing a certain Canadian work experience because the company I worked for was in the UK so Having the Canadian experience, if, if you're looking for work here in Canada, uh, that is something that a lot of companies do do value. And and having the schooling here in Canada with the with the program should also definitely give give you a leg up or or show to prospective employers, at least based on the feedback that I've gotten, um, that should give you some some advantage there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, Ashke. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Andy. I just have a couple of things uh, to share over here. So, like, um, Edgar, brilliant presentation. It was really engaging. I love the you. way that you presented uh, everything. Like, it was it was sort of minimalistic, and the point was getting across. So it was it was e easy to um, take in all the information. So yeah, uh, that was great. And uh, I was just going through uh, over your LinkedIn profile. So just had one question on that. I see that mm -hmm. you were working as a senior analyst insights, and then you switched over to digital analytics. How how are the two dif how are they different uh, insights? And in if if it if you can briefly sum sum it up, like I know it'd be a bit technical, but in case. Um. I'm probably going to disappoint you a little bit with the answer. When I was hired, I was hired as a senior analyst insights. Um, the company has been going through some reorganization and it's it's a title change. Um, the work is exactly the same. It's the same job. Um, the They didn't have a title for digital analysts or digital analytics uh, when I was hired in the company, but they added that to lend more uh, of a, a specific um, title to the job that I was doing. So maybe not quite the answer uh, or the detail, um, but uh, we did have other analysts or insights analysts who were focused a lot on maybe not the, 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 the digital data or the website and app data that we had, but looking at our um, our our collector data, so all of the the members of our program and presenting that. So they were providing insights on that particular segment and not relating it to our digital data. Um, I do more work on our app and website, so our mobile app and our website platforms as a digital analyst than they do. Um, so it was a title change, but there are nuances of 
the source of the data, um, maybe perhaps between the two different types of titles. Okay. Uh, if I can ask one more question, I just wanted to understand. Uh, you mentioned that you were able to show your potential employer that you had certain soft skills, say mm -hmm. research. So how was that? How did it come about that you were presented with that sort of an opportunity wherein you could actually present those soft skills? Because I'm also in that same sort of a situation wherein I had done something else. I have experience in some other field and I'm trying to switch now. So just wanted to understand how can one uh, transition carrying their soft skills? Um, the, the two jobs that I've had since leaving university, I've come at them in very different ways. Um, the first job, the one that really relied on the soft skills was definitely right place, right time and networking with the people who were able to offer me that job. Um, it, I put it on the slide, it literally was the question asked to me. Um, so uh, I'll rewind a little bit. I started working at a summer camp and the owner of the summer camp, his best friend, became my future boss. So we were in the same room at one time. He saw the work I was doing for his friend at the summer camp. He saw that I was hardworking, um, that I had uh, the degree that I had that I was able to put my knowledge to use in that job. And he literally asked me the question, how would you like to work in the energy industry? So we interviewed, I shared my thesis with him. Um, sharing a product of your work, I guess, maybe to give an answer, um, even if it's something you've done in, in school or in previous career, sharing what you can to show, um, obviously, Make sure you're not sharing any confidential information or any proprietary information if it's from a former employer. Um, but that, in addition to networking, um, is is what got my foot in the door. And then for the second job, um, the job I'm in now, there was also a networking component. Uh, in fact, one of uh, one of the professors at George Brown um, was my lead uh, for this job. Um, and but that was a that was a more formal process so that was just an introduction um i still had to put in my resume i had to show my experience i did a test um in my interview process uh, i had three different interviews with the company um and it clicked so again i went from i did change the scope of my work Quite a lot. I had a lot more skills that I'd learned on the job from my previous job, but that was a job where I was doing a lot of qualitative analysis, and this was a job that required quantitative analysis. But I showed through my resume and through other work that I could code. Um, they sent, they gave me that test to do. Um, it was an analysis piece, and what I did was I didn't just put together a PowerPoint slide, um, a PowerPoint deck. They were looking for someone with data visualization skills, and I knew that the organization worked with Tableau. So when it came time for me to present, I did my entire presentation in Tableau. And they said that when I, when I was hired and when I was speaking to my manager, they said, yeah, we were very impressed by that. That is something that you showed us, that even though your previous work wasn't what you what you're doing now you have the skills um that we're looking for for this role and will help develop you in the areas that you may not have the skills right away that's great. amazing amazing that's amazing yeah hk how do you feel now <laughs> you have the answers yeah, I'm I'm a bit more confident and I know what to focus on now. So yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and um, I mean I mean um he has given some great answers here, right? Um I think one thing that he mentioned is about I mean interpersonal skills and also networking skills, right? So he was approached by someone who happened um who then became his boss, right? He didn't know this person initially, but 
with good interpersonal skills, networking skills, I mean, you can land a job in Canada. And I think in Canada, most of the jobs landed are through networking. Now, but I think 70% of the jobs in Canada through networking, right? So if you have these soft skills, I think it will go a long way in helping you um, build your career. And um, yeah, and also as part of his soft skills that he mentioned, you know, he's able to identify business problems, research problems, and that's a critical thinking skills that you need, right? And also um, being um, an independent data analyst or researcher, because from his presentation, he has proven that well, he can work as a team, but at the same time, he can work, um, and I mean, with that influence or uh, under little or no pressure, that's being independent that data analyst. So I think there are so many soft skills that that he has mentioned here, now, and, and even I think time management, right? Time management, you have to be committed, work and stuff like that, yeah. Being able to pivot and adapt, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. set set one one focus aside, um, mm -hmm. multitasking. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all things that that really mm -hmm. that really help. Um, like you're saying, mm -hmm. the interpersonal skills, networking, um, and also it, it can be hard to come by. But just have the confidence mm -hmm. to put yourself mm -hmm. out there. You mm -hmm. you may not be the perfect candidate. But mm -hmm. chances are, there is no perfect candidate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need you need to showcase what you're good in uh, in doing and and what you're good at, and mm -hmm. hopefully there's a match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there's no perfect candidate. I like that, right? Because see, if I mean you are very good at running like running Python or the software out there, you're very good at analysis. I mean, you're the guru in data analytics, but if you lack these soft skills, it's very, very hard for you to land a job, right? So, yeah. Good. Are there any further questions um, for um, Ed Gavan? Are there any questions? Let's see. Um, Rain? Rain? Hi, Edgar. Can you hear me? I can yes. hear you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, it was really comforting to hear that you started from scratch. So like others in the group, I'm in a similar position. Um, based on the conversation um, conversations that I've heard so far, I'm assuming that everyone is in the analytics program here. Um, but I actually studied, um, I'm actually in the digital media marketing program at George Brown. And prior to this, I studied nutrition and food at so I'm completely out of my element, but um, for Sounds my- Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, for one of my um, digital marketing courses, I had to take an analytics course and I really enjoyed it and I'm interested in exploring it further. So do you have any resources for anyone um, or do you have any resources that you would, you would recommend for someone who wants to learn more? Um. It's a tough one, actually. Uh, I, I can speak to my personal situation where I focused quite a bit on on the technical skills, and I found that I really like um, data visualization. Uh, so the the person I mentioned, John Schwabish, um, he's written books. Uh, he has a YouTube channel, um, somewhat active on 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 Twitter and other social media, um, but he's a really good speaker to data visualization. Um, and I, I don't know how much you're looking at the marketing background, but that's also about storytelling and, and really putting out a message. Um, so that that might be one resource. Um, for my a lot of my technical skills, I go to Udemy, uh, follow courses that on on uh, on SQL and, and Python at the moment. Uh, SQL, a lot of my training is is self-taught uh, and, and on the job. Um, so yeah, th those are the types of resources that I would go to. Um, can't really say that I have much of a, a list, uh, but it, it that's also a bit of a personal um, 
mm. yeah, personal quite not a personal question necessarily, but personal preference is where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses? Mm -hmm. um, and you should look for resources based on your weaknesses where you want to grow them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, hopefully it answers your question a little bit. <laughs> it does. It does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good answers here. Yeah. So, um, Ren, um, I think another great platform is LinkedIn Learning. So, with your yep. George Brown um, stu student account, you have free access to all the learning resources on LinkedIn Learning. So, as Edgar said, I mean, identify the areas that you want to improve yourself, right? And then when you go there, there are I mean, a whole bunch of resources out there that you can, I mean, use for free being a student. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe find an expert or find someone who you can look up to who's doing what you want to do and follow them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are active on, on social media. Um, they will mm -hmm. share articles. They will share insights and, and talk about the topics mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of that learning through osmosis uh on on that mm -hmm. yeah great 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 okay so it's six um uh, four past six um i think our time is up um so edgar on behalf of um all the faculty members um in the analytics club i would like to say thank you so much uh for taking the opportunity to come and share with us um, You're very welcome. The best tips, I mean, in building yourself as data analyst. And I know, like, for sure, um, your presentation would go a long way in um, guiding most of our students um, in building their career as data analysts. Yeah, so thank you so much. And um, we'll, we'll have you again. We'll, we'll surely have you again. We should have you again. Yeah. Absol absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, to everyone who also took the opportunity to come and listen to our guest speaker today, and uh, thank you so much for coming. And don't forget, he's on LinkedIn. Um, you can add him, and then if you need any, well, if you have any further questions for him, I think he would be more than happy to, to help you on that. If only he's able to, I mean, if he's in the position of, I mean, giving you um, the right answers or helping you, I think he'll be more than happy to do that. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I can't give you answers on rocket science, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Okay. So. Right. Um, thank, thank you yeah. very much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Edgar Van, the mayor, and then, um, yeah, we'll connect again and to other students. You. We'll see you guys in the next speaker series. Okay. Have That's a wonderful evening and a good right, week ahead. Then. All right. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.